colloquy. I'm Nancy Davenport, the University Librarian here at American University, and I'm happy to welcome all of you to this event. We've been doing this for a series of years, and looking at a variety of ways that um, we try to both get information out about scholarly work that is done, and in some cases, we try to interrupt the um, established practices of that um, pretty much tie us to a fee-for-service model. And our speaker today is going to see if she can move us even a little bit further away from that model. Um, because the, we, open access and things being available free can be extraordinarily important, particularly in particular times. And I was just telling Charlotte Rowe, our speaker, that we had one of those times with our faculty members a couple of years ago. We had a faculty retreat, and at the end of the faculty retreat, we did a research competition. And it had to be two faculty members from different schools, or at least different subject areas, competing for it. And the two who won were studying Ebola. And they immediately took the money and went to Africa, where they had been invited to come, to study Ebola, and particularly the practices of caring for the sick and caring for the dead that were helping to propagate the disease. And they published immediately in open access journals because that was the kind of research that needed to get out without being behind a paywall. And the library and one of the School of Foreign Service helped to underwrite the fees for that research. So we, we right now are living in this sort of brokered world uh, where we have the majority of our library budget goes to support all of the research materials that we license um, and that includes the journals and databases. And at the same time, we like thinking that we are moving to a freer and more open world. And we have with us the communications librarian from um, the University of San Francisco, a Jesuit school that, like American University, describes itself as a school with a social justice mission. Welcome to our campus. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, yeah, I would, I actually, I recognize that Ebola story. I think I had read the news story a few years ago, so I thought that was amazing to tie in. Um, so uh, I'm a scholar communications library at the University of San Francisco, which is located near Golden Gate Park. So it's a nice location, and it, is, it does have a social justice mission. And this year, um, like many of you during Open Access Week, we celebrated um, the theme, which is open in order to. And I think the open access movement has so much to celebrate, right? These are the, this is the Registry of Open Access Repository Mandates, which I just took a screenshot of um, a few days ago. Um, as you can see, it's just gone up and up. There are so many that have opened this year alone, um, archives, so, like archive dupes. So that's been fantastic. Um, these are policy efforts from Spark, which is Located here in DC, um, you see things like the Executive Directive on Public Access, um, state initiatives on taxpayer-funded research, the National Campaign Fund Initiative, um, Bastard, the Fair Access to Science and Technology Research, the Open Government Data Act, all sorts of things that um, library, libraries have been working on to get past in terms of open access policy. And these are examples from the Spark website for this year. Um, Open access is a weak means to end poverty, uh, to help water scarce countries, you know, really fantastic sort of big problems that are um, being helped along by open access. This is from our repository. Um, the number one downloaded paper is a dissertation um, out of the School of Ed, and this is the kind of impact it's had all over the world. So it's been a really fantastic way to celebrate. But I, <laughs> so it's been a really great, um, way to look back on open access and how far we've come in so many ways. But I also want to show you all this video as a way to reframe what access is.
Thank you. Thank you. This is unreal. This is unbelievable. Some of you know I grew up in rural Alabama, very, very poor. Very few books in our home. And I remember in 1956, when I was 16 years old, with some of my brothers and sisters and cousins going down to the public library, trying to get a library of cards. And we were told that the library was for whites only and not for colors. And to come here and receive this award, this honor for this, it's too much. Thank you. But I had a wonderful teacher in elementary school who told me, read my child, read. And I tried to read everything. I love books. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Nate. And thank each and every one of you. And thank all of the judges. Thank you, National Book Foundation. Thank you so much. as well as 
once you get in it, like any feminized profession, into the higher um, administrative levels, more men, right? Um, very able bodied, very straight, heteronormative. And then this is the outcome, right? This is what happens to children's books. Um, this is what children see when they read books. And if we look back at the John Lewis video, of course, children grow up to be very important adults, right? Um, and. <sighs> Um, and the same is true for all the publishing professionals, if it's not even worse, right? So this was um, a study that was published in 2016. I actually got this survey because I was, you know, I, I, some people in publishing have passed to me. They had no category for Asians or Asian Americans in the survey. So I contacted the surveyors and I was like, hey, so from experience, having worked in publishing, I know that there are Asians. You should maybe have a category for them. <laughs> um, and they said, oh no, we thought it'd be confusing because it's supposed to be an international survey. Um, you're supposed to click mixed or multiple. And I was like, that's probably not, not appropriate. Luckily, they got back to me a few days later and said we had added the category. But yeah, so that's the kind of, that's, that was the perception of the people who were putting out the survey. So this is, I don't think, rigorous. It didn't contact the AUP, even though some press people did um, fill it out. And this is um, faculty in the US. This is um, tenured faculty. So it is limited, but I think it's important to look at tenured faculty because when I worked in publishing and I sent out proposals, I did look at the faculty and what their status was and whether they had prestige in the field and had the ability and the knowledge to review something. Right? So it's important. This is as of 15? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes. Well, no, not of 2015. Sorry, it's it's from the National Center for Education Statistics, and I think the latest is 2013. Okay. Yeah, but um, there's not been a lot of change in the last decade. Yeah. Um, and this is library professionals, and you guys are all familiar with the statistic, right? That shouldn't be um, strange to you. And keeping all those stats in mind, the similarity between all of them, um, I want us to consider the publishing process. Now, in my day-to-day -day life, a lot of what I do is sort of publishing workshops, right? And I always show this slide uh, because I think even though you are told the peer review process, until you go through it a, lot to, a few times, it's hard to visualize. So this chart is really helpful, and I created it, and it's CC BY, please use it, right, if you want to teach publishing to anybody. Because it's important for people to know that at this level, the editors, right, publishing professionals, at this level, your fellow academics, possibly tenure professors, right? Um, and then, you know, librarians who do the purchasing and the selection, right? They all hold power. And the demographics are kind of grim. Also, this slide is helpful because um, it lets people know that the librarians are part of that power, power process. A lot of times, scholars, they publish, and they're like, oh, they don't tell us to buy their book for the library, so it's helpful. And there are some outcomes in scholarship, right? In 2017, the American Historical Review um, assigned a book to a, no a review to a white supremacist, right? So they had to retract and apologize. Um, Hypatia, which is a feminist philosophy journal, um, analogized um, Rachel Dolezal to transgender people. I should say not the journal, but um, uh, an author. So they also retracted um, the paper and apologized. The journal of political philosophy had an issue devoted to Black Lives Matter with no black authors. They also had to apologize. Um, and Third World Quarterly um, published an article that in, in defense of colonialism, um, and 15 of its board members resigned. So three out of four of these, they apologized and retracted. Um, but how, how many stories are there that didn't hit the chronicle of education or inside higher ed? Like, how many stories are there that we didn't hear about? Right? Um, and what does that mean for faculty of color? Because, of course, publication means promotion and tenure, right? I don't know if you can read this, but it says Facebook keeps scrubbing this image of the faculty of color who have left Dartmouth over the past 15 years, right? So it becomes this revolving door of people who can't ac accomplish promotion and tenure. And for more reasons than publication, the problem is more multi layered and nuanced than publication. But we all know publication is a 
big factor in that, right? Kind of why did Facebook scrub that image? What, what I know that's, that's an interesting it? question, right? <laughs> I think someone at Dartmouth kept requesting for it to get taken down. That's my opinion. I do not presume to know what their um, algorithm is. So, during the wave of student protests a couple of years ago, I actually had a couple of people ask me, who were not in academia, Charlotte, you're in academia, what's happening? Why are these students complaining about the food in cafeterias being microaggressions? And I would say there are 80 schools that have put forth demands. That is not just people complaining about microaggressions. And their number one demand is faculty and staff of color, right? So students notice, right? There is an impact. And you can actually see what their demands are on the demands.org. Like it's done a good job of collecting everything. And it's not just in the US, right? Um, this is a really great article that was published actually in Nature. And if you go into the article itself, you can click and see the gender breakdowns of publication. Um, you can see here that the US by far has the largest share of published papers. There's a global dominance that happens, right? So there's a kind of hegemony. It's not kind of, but there is. Right? So it's something to consider. And so when I do information literacy classes with students, sometimes I say, what do you notice about these citations? Where are all these professors from? They're all from the US, right? It's something to consider. If we're talking about something like immigration, migration, you know, things that are happening outside of this country. Another thing is, of course, open access piece, who is our output? Um, Actually, a lot of the big five publishers have done a really aggressive job in acquiring publications and journals. It's sort of done like this gathering. What do you do? You buy things if you don't have them already. They, don't, they didn't have the platform to open access. Now they do. Over 50% of papers published, period, worldwide, are owned by the big five. And they really see themselves as technology providers at this point, right? Elsevier, Wiley, they are all positioning themselves not to just be publishers, but, um, but they're buying things. If you look, it says Research Gates raises 52.6 million for a social research network for scientists. And it makes sense because technologists are coming to this to academia and academic publishers are moving towards technology in those two ways. And what does that mean? when everybody's trying to grab the technology platforms and the intellectual property, what kind of value does it have when we're not getting paid, right? <clears throat> Scholars are not getting paid for their papers. And Google Scholar, we don't think twice about it. I use it all the time, right? I actually, this is like a screenshot from my recommended. It was like, Science Metrics is Science Successful Women in Science. Journal Port is an important infrastructure for non-commercial scholarly. I was like, oh, these are things I'm interested in. It knows me really well. <laughs> yeah, right? But we, we know that Google is not neutral. It's not good. If you're familiar with Sophia Noble's work, and I think she spoke here before, um, she's not, it's not, um, it's something we should think twice about. You know what they say, um, if it's free, then the product is you, right? Um, and that continues into altmetric, altmetrics and, um, and library discovery systems, which are both meant to be biased, right? Yeah, recently I saw a tweet from some conference where it was like, a lot of women are discovering they're being trolled online through altmetrics, right? So, women scholars, yeah, and they never knew. A lot of women scholars are finding out they're being trolled online through altmetrics. So let's see, it's spike and the click, and it turns out they're being trolled. But it looks good in all metrics because it got a spike, but it's very strange. Yeah. <clears throat> and also, like, who owns our OA spaces? Now, I go to a lot of conferences and conversations about open access, and very frequently there are very few people of color in the room. Um, recently, April Hathcock and I were at the same meeting, and I'm so grateful to her for writing about this because there was an unconference breakout on the Global South. And everybody, every person of color basically like stood up and went to that room. So much so that the main conference was like, should we just make this on conference all about this? And then they went, no, let's talk about this instead. So that like they had like the, all the people of color interested in the global south, and they chose not to make that the main subject of the conference. So we just went to another room and discussed, right? Um, 
So, um, and Lorraine Chun, who um, works a lot in open access internationally, and she's out of Canada, she talks about how being nice is not enough, right? Like how she personally is experiencing negative, ex negative experiences that, um, in the open access world, right? And she's very well known. And lastly, I had mentioned previously, like, how technology platforms are being purchased. Um, that includes open access platforms. You all know that the press was acquired this year. That is only the last in a string. Um, society journals, um, journals that are in Hindawi or Cielo or um, Versita, they've all been acquired over the last 10 years. This has been part of the strategy. Right, the press is just the latest. So as I talk to you all about these dire things <laughs> in open access and what threatens it and what, what threatens what is truly access, um, I want to encourage us to reach further, right? Um, this is a keynote from the Society of American Archivists. Archivists. Um, come, it's not just about saying, come, come into the archives. Even if it's open and free, you can just walk in. You don't even need ID. Just come in. Just put the gloves on. But you know it's cool. You don't need ID. That's not enough because these institutions for centuries have been telling oppressed peoples who do not belong here. You can't change that just by sending out an email and saying, hey, it's open, and then sitting there and saying, why are people of color coming? It's important to say, how do we make this information is accept make sure that this information is accessible? How do we take this knowledge that people actually want and that what we assume they want out into the community where folks can use it and engage with it? So I want to say that, you know, well, as we make things open access, it's really important that we don't just reinforce what is institutionally in place. Institutions can be good, but also they have their problems, right? Um, we, we as librarians, as libraries, are institutions, and we have the same biases and injustices that institutions have, right? And in that way, while we try to make things open access, we have to think about what we are reproducing in our systems. And this idea of vocational awe is from philosophy and chart, which I think is really fantastic. It's something I've encountered in publishing, too. When I worked in publishing, there was this sense that we were doing good in the world, right? And lastly, this is something new that I've been thinking about and working on which is that we rely on technology, and we have the same problems with technology. There are conflict metals, there are problems in the labor stream. Um, I live in Silicon Valley, pretty much, so I can tell you that they're not thinking about these kinds of things on, a, on the scale that they should be. And I want to say that I, the ALA Sustainability Roundtable just put forth the statement, and I can see in the future students and institutions asking to divest from conflict metals and e-waste, the way that we changed people's opinions on investment in oil and prison systems. So that's something I'd like to see in the future. Lately, there's been a lot of, and this is the one aspect that I see things changing on, there have been a lot of lawsuits. These are the two, Harvard, MIT, Berkeley, they are the lawsuits that really hit the news, but actually the University of Minnesota keeps a list of lawsuits. There are quite a few that were settled outside of court. But there's been a great response to these things, right? I've been seeing movement. So hearkening back to the John Lewis video, while we did shut people out, I think we have the capability and the power to change things, right? Uh, the Library Coalition's, frame, Coalition's Ethical Framework for Library Publishing of which I'm part as the Library Publishing Coalition's, coalitions LPCs, one of the LPCs and our fellows. Um, they have an ethical task force, which is doing a great job of researching these issues that I've mentioned, right? Um, and more, right? Privacy, all these kinds of things. Um, the AUP, the American University Presses, has a diversity fellowship that's already made an impact. Um, Martin Paul E., who's the co-director of the Open Library of Humanities, has a commitment to diversity across the platform, not just in their authorship, but also in the editorial boards. Um, the OpenCon just recently put forth a diversity statement. It's not perfect, it's not implemented, but it's a start, right? Um, there's a really great um, effort called the Knowledge Gap that looks at sort of the geopolitics I mentioned, the US to have this hegemony. And there are combined OER efforts on accessibility across the country that are just happening. I want to say that some of it is because of lawsuits, right? And they should have been open, open to everyone's disabilities to begin with. But if it happened because of lawsuits, then I'm very happy with it. 
right? Open Air Oregon has some guidelines on uh, making OER successful. So that's really fantastic. So I've been seeing movement. All of this is all not all negative. There's been progress. And I think we can all work on that, right? I think we can work on including open access and marginalized publications in, in your catalog, right? As part of the power structure diagram that I mentioned earlier, we can work on supporting open access efforts like you're doing here at American, right? Putting money towards that. Um, we, you can also subscribe to publications that provide a voice for the marginalized. I've seen many library sites where CLO isn't necessarily listed in the catalog. It is an open access resource. It costs nothing for you to put it in there. When I work with migration studies students or international studies students, those are two of the liaison roles that I've been assigned, I show them CLO and Redelec, and they're like, oh my goodness, right? Like, I, these, this is so helpful, right? Things are in Portuguese, Spanish, um, and English on those websites. Um, you can also educate faculty and students. Publishing is much different than it used to be, right? Um, the number one thing I say when people say, oh, blah, 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 right? Like, oh, when it goes out of print, don't I get my rights back? And I say, maybe last century, right? Because last century wasn't that long ago, but it was last century, the last time something went out of print. It's all digital now. Yeah. Um, and also, I want you to see yourself as part of the scholarly communications ecosystem. It's really easy to see yourself as either a consumer, a reader, or an author, and not necessarily part of the power structure. But you are. We, we are reviewers. We are editorial board members. If not that, then we know editorial board members. Maybe someone is a really important scholar, and you wouldn't normally talk to them because you're intimidated, but you can go up to them and be like, hey, I see your board, editorial board member at your World Quarterly. What do you think about this that was published? Right? It's, that is part of their role, is to leave for their journals. Right? And you can partner with those who are doing social justice and work in the community, as I'm sure many of you already do. Um, and question the journals that you read. Right? So question the journals that you publish in, that you subscribe to. Say, what's your diversity statement policy? How are you addressing accessibility? That's it. Also, I want to acknowledge the Native um, Americans whose land we are currently on. Yes. Uh, so I noticed that you had, when you were covering the scholarly publishing landscape, uh, that you hadn't mentioned Sci-Hub. So I'm kind of curious where you see its place yeah. with regards to social justice issues. So 60% of the papers in Sci-Hub are actually not there illegally. Right? So it's an interesting conversation. And I think when people talk about pursuing Sci-Hub, they neglect to understand that the papers that are up there are up there by the same method as ResearchGate or Academia.edu, which is that authors often put up their own papers. And also, it doesn't exist as it is right now. Right now, it's duplicated in pieces all over the world. So in some ways, Sci-Hub is being destroyed by the forces that oppose it. I don't like the criminalization of the people who are behind what I have. I think that's really weird to hunt someone down for copyright and make their life bankruptable and impossible and ruin their career, right? So that's my opinion on it. There are a lot of legal ways to make access available, and this year I was at the Society of Scholarly Communication, and for the first time I feel, uh, Society Publishing, sorry, um, and for the first time I think people start to realize that the reason people were turning to Sci-Hub was not necessarily just because of paywalls, but because infrastructures made it really annoying and difficult, right? Like, the UX was bad. <laughs> so I think that's a lot of the reason why Sci-Hub exists, is because of the UX, because studies have found that people who use Sci-Hub quite often have access. They just don't realize they have access, because they'll try to log in from off-campus, and it won't work. So yeah, so I've been talking to some um, society publishers and commercial vendors about the UX. And I've been seeing a transition of why. I haven't been seeing a change in the way Sci-Hub and the people who are behind it are being criminalized. So that I, just, I don't approve it for the same reason Aaron Schwartz, like I don't approve him being criminalized in Shakespeare either. The same thing is happening, right? So that's my opinion. I, I was recently at a meeting of urban librarians, they're non-academic, but <clears throat> public libraries, and 
you know, on one hand, I was really impressed that the, th the thrust of the meeting and the, the focus of the meeting was on diversity and basically making sure we were libraries were inclusive and that we were yeah, implementing yeah. diversity for democracy's sake. But the thing is, it just kind of felt to me, and I, and I brought this up, and I didn't really feel too intimidated behind it, but, you know, I had this sense that, you know, there was a sense that, that libraries are these free and open spaces and light and information is just flowing and that we welcome, we welcome, we welcome everyone and we reflect everyone and yeah. all that. But really, I mean, I'm from the South and I've not, I'm old enough kind of to remember some things that were discriminatory. And I remember how libraries played an active role yeah. in supporting Jim Crow. Yeah, yeah. And so I said, you know, there are some things that, again, the statistics that you showed, but they, but they bear out that these are vestiges. Yeah. You know, even though we're being intentional and trying to be more intentional about being uh, open to different parties, being involved in the academic processes and academic information and knowledge sharing, there's still some things that are obviously yeah. remnants and vestiges of yeah. a very, very different scenario mm -hmm. that is still carried out. So, I mean, that's the kind of thing that, you know, that intentionalism needs to really be bumped up. And yeah. I think the, ones, the points that you make there are ways that you can actively yeah. reverse yeah. Yeah. these. these I, I think the ideals of librarianship are great. The mm -hmm. idea that we are in neutral space, the idea that we're open to everyone, that we're inclusive with everyone, I think those ideals are amazing. And I think we hit as close as we can being the people we are in this era, but we can always do better, right, of course. Um, and this actually, uh, Tracy McMillan Cotton, who wrote the book Lower Edge, she says in her book, um, for me, perpetuating inequalities resulting from intergenerational cumulative Disadvantage doesn't require intent. In fact, racism and sexism work best of all when intent is not prerequisite, right? So basically, she's saying, like, bias works best when we don't care, right? Mm -hmm. All we have to do is go along with the structures that are already in place, and that's how we get to a racist, sexist sort of um, outcome, right? So, yeah, and I think that what libraries do quite frequently because of our ideals is push back against that. And that's why, like, what I have to say, this presentation has done really well amongst librarians. So I'm really happy. And I've been seeing a shift in how people are addressing these issues over the last few years in a way that I didn't when I worked in publishing. So that's great. Um, the Leon Low survey has done a lot to push publishers in sort of this generation, direction, right? It was embarrassing for publishers. Even though they had actually been reporting on the same statistics every year in Publishers Weekly. There are articles in Publishing Weekly that say, like, publishing is still white, right? Mm -hmm. But the Lee and Lowe survey really quantified it, and it was really actually a librarian, Sarah Dawn Park, who worked on it. So she's at the University of Minnesota. No, she's at St. Catherine, sorry, in Minnesota. St. Catherine's in Minnesota. Not in Minnesota. Yeah, but. Yeah. So she worked together with the CBC. So I'm a, a lay person here, so I was wondering if you could. Um, one thing I'm a little bit confused on, when is open access really open access, or when um, is it pseudo open access, or not really open access? Yeah, I mean, it's a spectrum, right? Um, there are people who only need to read the thing for free, and that's good enough for them. But for a lot of scholars, what they'd like is not just that article or book that you read, but also the data to be open and free for everyone to use. Um, when we get to open education, we want everything to be free, not only to use, but to remix and recreate however we want. So, so we do see a spectrum of open access. And I do think it should be up to the author, right? Like someone who's writing a poem has very different needs from someone who's writing a textbook and statistics, right? So um, at the same time, like how much are we holding on to that? How much of that uh, creativity is being locked down? Right now, copyright is 70 years after death. I personally, as an academic, do not care for my work to be locked down long after it's relevant. Right? And I meet a lot of scholars who their work is owned by a publisher, and they're like, I want to make this freely available now. I'm retiring soon. I don't get any royalties. Right? So that's another piece of the open access movement is the rights of the author which don't necessarily coincide with their actual legal rights. So open access is a spectrum. I think it depends on how things are going to be used. Yeah. But ideally, everything would be open to everyone to use or reuse or remix or 
um, read, especially in the academic environment. I was wondering if you could comment on the AP APCs for open access and yeah. how that fits into yeah, this yeah, yeah. framing of access itself, especially mm -hmm. across disciplines where yeah. you know the social sciences and the humanities do not have the same, same funding revenue yeah. that would allow authors yeah. to you know bear the burden of yeah. these high APCs for open access journals. Yeah, this is one of those things where I, I think pe a lot of people, especially in humanities, don't know the history of APCs, right? Mm -hmm. So APCs, for those of you who don't know, are basically fee for publishing open access, right? So you not only turn over your copyright, you also pay in order to make your paper available open. Don't do that. Make your paper available open access in some sort of subject repository before you sign over your copyright because you own it and you can make it open. Um, but uh, APCs existed before the open access movement, right? In a lot of STEM fields, it was traditional to pay anyway. You paid per page, so it was print. You paid per table or graph or chart. You paid extra if you wanted them in color, right? And PLOS basically took the existing model and put it on top of the open access platform. They were like, sure, we'll just have people pay what they normally pay, what the market bears, and then make everything available open access, right? So right now, the cost of APCs is not determined on what it takes to publish. It's determined on what the market can bear. They are basically two income streams, right? Extra. So people don't understand that, that either, right? That's why some places that don't have APCs, they're still able to function, right? So for those of you who are running into APCs that your scholars can't pay or you can't pay, negotiate. Tell them you don't have any grant funding, right? Um, and see what they say, because it's what the market can bear. And if you were the market who is paying, then you should be able to negotiate. Some people are told, oh, you need, to you need to partner with someone in the West, which I think is someone in the West who has, like, money, basically. Because, of course, this is, like, so a basically a different kind of paywall, right? People whose salary, monthly salary or yearly salary is equal to the APCs are told, like, oh, you should partner with someone in the West. I think that's unfair because it's research that they did, it's work that they did. Even the dean of the School of Education talks about how the work that her father did in Tibet was like stolen by the World Bank, right? There is a history of colonization of knowledge, um, of sort of mining of knowledge. We go into places, we do research, we leave, like it's, that's not something we want to perpetuate, right? So I think it takes education. Um, and also, one of the wonderful things about the open access movement is that it's put the tools of publishing into people's hands, right? Everyone says that the Gutenberg Press is so great, but I don't think it would have been that great without the invention of paper, right? Like, everyone says open access is so great, it's great because the technology has enabled people to, like, throw something up online. And that's the case with, like, Radalock and Cielo and Hindawi and even, like, local places that just, like, write reports that maybe are not IRB approved or important to the people in the area and just sort of online. Right? It's important to those people. It's important that we don't say, like, this isn't rigorous. We have to look at the context. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't think I have to I don't want to say the name, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, uh, upending the peer review process as well yeah. is um, yes. one of the approaches to this. I think so. I mean, definitely because of the diagram I showed about like power and like, what those people are, and like those examples of where Peru has gone horribly wrong. Like the World Quarterly got a lot of attention, and it turned out like that in that article. I don't know if all of you know, but that article in defense of colonialism didn't pass peer review. Nobody, everybody was like, it shouldn't be published. But and the editor, published yeah, the editor decided to publish it anyway. So it's total breakdown of the process, right? And whoever the peer reviewers were for. The Rachel de Lazelle article and like the um, a few of the, the they weren't correctly chosen, they weren't correctly done. So there's been arguments for transparency in peer review. Um, some people are scared; they don't want their reviews. They feel like people will be on, honest, totally valid. Um, I think one of the things I've been arguing for is cultural competency for editorial and reviewers. Yeah. But also, it's another form of labor that isn't being paid, so it's hard to ask for more. It's complicated, but yeah, definitely the peer review system is problematic. Double blind doesn't always mean quality. I talked to someone who was trying to put together a philosophy journal, 
and they were trying to bypass some of the problems around bias, especially sexism, because philosophy philosophy has a very rough bad reputation when it comes to sexism. And they said we did a double blind peer review process and we ended up with the same sort of papers that you would find in any philosophy journal. So I was like, bypass it. Just do invited papers for the first couple of issues. Right? Just do it. That's fine, right? It's fine if you do that, especially for the people that you want to hear from. Like, why do we have to go to the peer review process when we know these scholars are amazing and we want to hear from them? And other journals do it all the time. But since they were starting a new journal, they didn't know that. Double blind, and ultimately is only single blind. Yeah. Because the reviewers will yeah. eventually find out who the author is when the paper is published. Yeah. The author will not necessarily yeah. be able to find out who the reviewers were. Yeah, and it's not true blind because the editors see everything. It's kind of like, um, you know how in orchestras they started getting people to rehearse behind a screen or uh, audition behind a screen. Do you know about this? And a lot of major orchestras. Um, they were very male dominated. So they started um, having people audition behind a screen, and lo and behold, more women advanced to the advanced past the first round. <laughs> I know, right? Then it was a 50 50 split. Um, so now that's why you see more women in orchestra. It's not better, that's just the first round, and then after that, it's the same process. But like, we put up the screen and we say it's pure view, but it doesn't help if the people who are placing the screen, like the editors, are actually the final decision makers. What do you see as, I guess, the prospects then? I mean, if you look at these trends of mm -hmm. increased diversity within publishing houses, journals, editorial board, is, do you see that trend basically dipping more, plateauing more, as with the rise of open access? I mean, I'm just asking for your opinion about what, how do you see, do you see, again, do you see that, again, like you use that yeah. screen thing? You see yeah. that any trends that have shown that with open access and with more, um, uh, I guess, kind of shrouding about people's identities as, as a legal fault, that things are improving? Or is it pretty much the same? So I want to say things are improving, but I've only seen them improving in the past few years. I don't, oh, there's some journal. Um, there's a geophysical society that just tried to change the demographic of its reviewers. Yeah. So they found that their peer reviewers, the people who were doing the reviews, were mostly men. So they've, they've added more women to their list of reviewers. So that's like just in the last year. So I have been seeing change, right? So that's been happening. And I'm hoping that the outcome is more positive, right? I mean, if John Lewis can win a National Book Award for his comic book, <laughs> um, then yeah, maybe we can have more parity. And also, like I said earlier, what I've been seeing is a lot more journals and publications out of places that we didn't privilege. But I've also been seeing like the co-opting of that, right? Um, for example, the University of New Mexico had a staple of journals that they sold to Elsevier. I don't know why. It was completely state funded. It was open access, right? And actually, things in South America and Latin America have been open access to begin with because things are state funded. Um, it was, a, I think, it was a bad idea, right? And every and the scholars at the University of New Mexico were unhappy at it. But I can see the argument, right? I can see also we're saying we're going to pay you a ton of money and we're going to run it for you. Mm -hmm. But basically, they're flipping to the Western subscription model, right? And also, I've been seeing moves in China. I know there's been a lot of news about like plagiarism and censorship and all this negativity, but I've also been seeing moves in China to move towards a Western system of intellectual property and censorship and Western ideas of what copyright are. And whenever I teach about plagiarism and copyright and censorship, I always say, you know, plagiarism is a Western ethical uh, construct, right? Like, in a lot of communities, knowledge, once it is created and shared, it doesn't belong to you anymore, it belongs to the community. We like to say Edison made the light bulb, right? He didn't. He didn't. He created a commercially viable light bulb, but he was not the inventor of the light bulb. He was, however, the owner of several companies after that, and he had a stable of inventors who helped him. Like, he made a lot of money. GE, right? Like, it's all, it all traces back to Edison. Like, this idea of intellectual property and copyright has capitalist sort of outcomes that benefit certain people. And I, I see China sort of flipping over to this model of, like, Western individualism. And I 
I don't know if it's good or not, but I think it's sad when we see an entire huge country sort of being like, oh, this isn't ethical. I'm like, oh no, it's not ethical by Western standards, right? So. But do, do you see that as an effort for them to be able to be a part yeah. of, you know, sort of conforming to what's acceptable? I mean, you yeah. To be able to compete, yeah. and to be able to get published. Definitely in conversations with scholars from around the world, they're very aware of their second class citizenship status and how whatever they put out won't be respected unless it's put out in nature or science or what have you, right? And it, and it hurts because there is a huge bias, right? Um, the World Bank put out this paper, basically they looked at all the economics profession, uh, publications, and they found that even in journals about international economics, if it was about the US or um, basically like a Western power, then it had more chance of getting published, right? So then you found like economics, um, like if you were studying economics in India, then you would change your topic in order to get published so you could get tenure. But then we need more, like Zika was discovered like in the 40s or something, right? So it becomes this, this publication bias becomes sort of a de facto research agenda. That's really scary. Right? So. How has your scholarship changed library practices where you are? Oh yeah. So I'm very lucky because the University of San Francisco is not only um, a Jesuit social justice oriented, but it's also in San Francisco, which is very liberal. Yes. Um, so we're right now talking about how to retroactively make accessible to disability readers are institutional repository items. We've started out, like literally like last week, um, we put up a statement saying like, we will make accessible anything that you find that is not accessible, right? So we, we can, that change, and sort of talking about how to make everything in, in there accessible. Um, I've actually been really fortunate in that when I go around talking about an open access policy or an open ed uh, program, both of which I'm trying to start, um, the feedback is always positive. They're like, well, that sounds great. We should do that, right? Unlike at a lot of places where um, when you say open access is a social justice issue, people are like, ah, I don't know about that. But everybody on my organization is on board. It's just a matter of doing that. Um, and I, I have, like, I'm working with a disability scholar who says she has trouble getting published, which I hadn't considered. Like, I'd always thought of it from the user end, but it never occurred to me that if you're writing and studying disabilities, then people aren't going to consider that important enough to publish. So that's something that I'm working on too. Like, what are the possibilities? How can I write a letter to the editor with them, right? To be like, hey, so we've noticed we published this much. <laughs> Maybe we just explain it a little bit more, that kind of thing. So, and also just publishing um, journals. Like, we just launched the International Journal of Human Rights Education. I'm really excited. So I don't think I'm doing anything that different from any other university library with the scholar communications program, right? It's just a matter of recognizing what we're trying to do, and to do that mindfully so that we're hitting everything that we know we should be hitting, right? Much like the open education accessibility thing. We all knew we should have made them accessible to disability readers, and we didn't put in that effort. We didn't build it into the flow. So we have to go back and build it in, because the administration is not going to care until they get sued, but we care, right? So when I say the administration, I mean outside the library. <laughs> I just had a comment to the earlier question about how to define open access versus stuff that isn't really open access. Mm -hmm. um, so I run an open education program here at AU um, out of CCR, the Center for Teaching, Research, and Learning. Um, so I'm not a librarian, but one thing that I think is similar between open education and open access, and related to the theme of you know this talk of how to subvert publisher powers, I think publishers try and get in on that label to make themselves yeah. appear as open. Um, whether it's open access publishing yeah. or you know open educational resources. Oh yeah, definitely been seeing that. Um, OER, yeah. Right, and so it's like anything that's online is open, you know, yeah. or anything that's um, you know what it, there could be a Creative Commons license on something, but it's behind a paywall, but that's yeah. that's not open, you know. Yeah. So I think that's one way. That I think there is a spectrum, but I think one thing yeah. that we all can do is be firm on what we believe yes. open means, yes. and you know push back against that when mm -hmm. publishers are trying to. Make yeah. themselves appear as open and generous, and yeah. you know, available for the for everyone when they're not really. Yeah, yeah. Um, for the practitioner.
practitioners in the room who are working with authors, um, one of the things that I tell authors when they're negotiating a contract is include in the contract that you can make it freely available on your website and the institution's repository. Because right now, it's all outside of the contract, right? It's in the like publisher's policies on their website, like what you can do, right? Like you go to Sherpa Romeo and you say, I can make this available on my repository. That can change. That is a permission that the publisher is giving you outside of the contract. It's not written in your contract. It has no, like they gave you permission, they can't necessarily take it back, but in the future, like they might be like, where's the proof that, you, that we gave you permission to do this, right? So I'm constantly saying, like, put it in your contract, they'll give it to you. This is a little thing that is not a big deal right now. Right now we're in an environment where they'll give it to you, right? So, so that's one of the things I always push for. Same with OER, like, yeah, like I say, like, in the contract, if you're going to work with the publisher, if you're going to, if you as an OER person is working with the author, I always put it in the memorandum of understanding with the author, like, what our rights are, what our goals are. Because I've seen some OER actually go private. Yeah. Like itself. Yeah. Yeah, there's like a co opting that happens. It's uh, yeah, so I'm glad that you're talking about um, like contracts and accessibility because uh, that intersects with what I do. So um, we work on licensing the resources, and when we do that for e resources, we Right now, we're doing things like requesting VPATs from uh, yeah. publishers and making sure that we get verbiage that you know shows their compliance with like ADA and WCAG and things like that. So um, I'll share an anecdote. Uh, I was working on licensing a new resource. Uh, I won't call it the vendor, um, but it's a new streaming video resource, and I was bringing up these accessibility issues with them, and I was speaking to them, and the uh, uh, like, I guess the. CEO of this company who I was speaking with said, we spent, like we've invested $12 million like into the streaming video project and would be a hundred, like it would be an extra $150,000 to caption the videos. And I was just kind of like really taken aback that, you know, they yeah. saw that as just like this insurmountable cost, like compared yeah. to what they've invested in it. So um, I don't know if it's really a question, but apart from, you know, just saying we're not going to buy this resource, like how else would we exert pressure on them? I mean, I would ask them where they got that number, right? If that number is because of labor, right, then it makes sense, that number makes sense. Because you need to hire a human to do all that, right? If a lot of it is automated, ask them for a breakdown of the numbers and whether it makes sense or not. And if it doesn't make sense, then, then point it out to them. Be like, this is actually unfair and we can't afford it. Um, and also, like, we are legally bound to make things accessible. If we can't afford it, then we can't buy this. They'd rather make a sale than not, right? So that's one of the things. I will say, so the Cal States have been, California State University system has been making a huge push towards making its um, work accessible, including on the vendor end, right? So they go through a lot of things. So they have a list of vendors that they're either put out already or have, ha are going to put out that um, basically are approved for making their things truly accessible. It's always nice to have a to be like, look, this is going to be the norm. It's not an extra. You better get on board and get all your things. And then you can actually push it as like a selling point. Like, all your things are accessible by default. So changing the framework, because the framework is changing, right? Yeah. Be like, hey, I know you're trying to, you're not going to sell to anybody this way, right? Like, this is becoming part of legislation. It is already part of legislation. Like, right? so. yeah, I just want to tail end on that, another issue. Because I work in the federal government, and so I acquire resources. Federal government, you're required to be accessible. So um, I work with a contractor that produces content for my site. And one of the issues is that they are fully compliant. They make sure everything is compliant. They check all the boxes. Every uh, requirement is met. But there isn't a focus on the experience of the user. <laughs> and so that's where the issue comes in. Because they made a compliant PDF for me. And my expert, which we keep on the side to check these folks, was like, yes, this is beautiful. It's great for sighted users, but it's not really useful to a non-sighted user, yeah. even though it checks off every box. It's fully compliant. Yeah. And so we constantly have to fight for, the, for what a non-sighted user, yeah. that experience. So you can still be fully compliant, but you're still not meeting the needs of that yeah. user. 
And it takes extra effort and resources. Yeah. It does. Yeah. I mean, but I do know of open education efforts where the captioning was done in partnership and the university took the rights. Right? So, especially in different languages, which is like a nice exercise, for example, for like a Mandarin class. They caption something, then it's accessible to people with disabilities in Mandarin, right? So, like, it's kind of like, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me.